Well, hello, and welcome to my latest video. Movie review time. The Lost King. Uh, written by Steve Coogan and Jeff Punk, and directed by Stephen Frears, and starring Steve Coogan and Sally Hawkins. I saw it with my uh, one of my favourite movie buddies, my wife Jane, at the East Dulwich Picture House. What's it like? Is it any good? Should you spend your money stick around and you'll find out. Now, when I was a uh, teenager, I suppose 15, 16, 17, something like that, I was, I'm probably younger than that, actually, I was very interested in Richard III. In fact, I suppose I, my three kind of heroes at that time were Richard III, uh, Che Guevara and uh, Marilyn Monroe. And I also had that poster of, you know, the the girl in the tennis dress on the tennis court. If you're a certain age, you'll know exactly what I mean. Anyway, so I know, actually, or did know quite a lot about Richard III, the last Plantagenet King of England. So I was fairly interested in this film, fairly knowledgeable about what it was talking about. What the film is about, if you, if you don't know, uh, Richard III uh, killed at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. A uh, body had never been found, and uh, Sally Hawkins plays a woman called Philippa Langley, I think, uh, who becomes very interested in Richard III and decides to find his body. Big surprise, does she find it? Well, that is what the film is about. It's about you know, Sally Hawkins as Philippa Langley, based. And what's suspicious of that? Based on a true story, or it is a true story, but how much of it is true? Uh, she becomes, she's a kind of, what is she? She's a sort of put-upon, um, mousy uh, little woman uh, trapped in a loveless marriage with Steve Coogan, who plays the husband, uh, in a, a job as a telesales kind of person. She suffers from ME, um, chronic fatigue syndrome. I probably ought to know what ME stands for, but I'm afraid I don't. Um, anyway, she goes to see a performance of Shakespeare's Richard III, at a school and becomes entranced by the story and becomes fascinated by Richard III. She joins the Richard III Society, which I occasionally I sort of flirted with joining, but luckily uh, never did that particular line of madness I managed to avoid. And, uh, and she develops this obsession and she decides to find his body and lo and behold, uh, if you've ever watched the news, she finds the body. So that is what the film is about, and that is that is basically all the film is about. Um, she has these um, she has these run-ins with uh, Leicester University, uh, and uh, generally, although not exclusively, uh, men who kind of poo-poo her feelings that she thinks she knows where Richard is buried, and uh, and because she's a she's an amateur. Uh, archaeologist, she's not a she's not a professional historian. There are various people who make fun of her and say you don't really know what you're talking about, love. But uh, she sticks to her guns, and uh, well, she ends up she she finds the skeleton. Now, my wife Jane, I ought to say, really loved the film. I I kind of. Well, it, it, it was right, actually. It's, it's, it's fairly enjoyable. I mean, there isn't really any more, any less to, to the story that I've described. One of the things I suppose I found about it was it's a little bit boring, actually. I mean, there's, you know, search, search for the, the skeleton, search for the body. And of course, of course. Now, Richard III, and I was trying to think of, of other people, of other historical figures, who attract the same kind of um, passion, I suppose, interest and passion. One of the ones I came up with, actually, was T.E. Lawrence, who, funnily enough, uh, I developed a probably a rather unhealthy interest in and read 65 books on T.E. Lawrence some years ago, most of which, of course, I've largely forgotten. But there's a lot of people who think that uh, T.E. Lawrence uh, was murdered and there's a lot of people who think that Richard III did not murder the princes in the tower. Now, why it's so important to these people to believe or try and establish that Richard III was not 
Maybe let's just call him Richard, was not responsible for the death of the Prince of the Town. I'm not quite sure. There's a Shakespeare's play, of course, presents Richard as this kind of you know, hunchback, you know, hunched over, wicked usurper, and so on and so forth. Which uh, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But in many respects, I think what one has to understand is that fourteen. The 1480s, in fact, the whole of the 15th century in Britain during the Wars of the Roses was an incredibly brutal, brutal period in, in British history. And uh, uh, death was, was never far away. Uh, and death was never much of a surprise, actually. So the thing about the princes in the tower is that we will never know for certain who was responsible, whether it was Richard or whether it was somebody else. But the most likely theory, I think, and I think a lot of other people think, is that Richard was responsible for their deaths. And he's the most likely person because he had the most to gain from it. Now, I'm sure members of the Richard III Society who watch this review will bombard me with kind of trolling remarks and say, Julian, you know as little about Richard III as you know about most other things, especially cycling. Uh, and I would say, well, what, does it really matter when, when he when murdered them or not? It didn't change whether he was a good king. It didn't change whether he was a bad king. I mean, he was... At the time, it was the sensible thing to do. It was the pragmatic thing to do. It was the, it was the obvious thing to do. I mean, they were the, the two sons of his elder brother, Edward IV. And therefore, they were the rightful uh, kings of England, if you like. And he was the younger brother. Now, I suppose you could say, if you want to draw a parallel, uh, imagine Prince Charles had died. Prince Charles had two children, William and Harry, which he did. But his younger brother, let's for the sake of argument, call him Andrew, uh, decides that uh, he'd actually rather be king and probably make a better king than William and Harry. So what does he do to William and Harry? Well, he would send them to the tower. We don't want to keep them alive because they're just going to be, they're just going to be trouble, aren't they? They're going to be going on. I don't know, Opera Winfrey and, and giving interviews and writing tell-all books and so on and so forth. And Andrew's going to say, I don't, I don't fucking need this. So what would he do? Well, he'd get rid of them. And that's what Richard would do. And that's what almost, almost certainly Richard did do. But obviously, you know, Ricardians, as they call themselves, don't want to believe this. And Sally Hawkins, as Philip Amagli, doesn't want to believe this and wants to think that Shakespeare traduced Richard III's character, which he probably did, maybe then for probably sensible reasons. There's a, a couple of other things uh, uh, about the film. Um, uh, uh, Sally Hawkins has a, has a kind of vision, I suppose, of, of Richard, who appears to her in, in kingly garb throughout the film and kind of guides her on her quest. Now, is this is this part of the true story? Somehow I doubt it. I imagine this is put in for the benefit of uh, uh, the movie experience, and it kind of it, it kind of works and it kind of doesn't. Um, uh, Steve Coogan, uh, well, Steve Coogan is, is playing a straight role. Funnily enough, it's a fairly small uh, role, a fairly important role, and he's not. Un unnecessarily Steve Coogan-ish, which he often is in the, in the film. Um, I found the music rather rather jarring. It's a bit too loud. It's a bit too in your face. It's a bit too unnecessary, actually. I suppose what it's partly trying to do is to make the film a bit exciting, which it rather isn't. The other thing about Sally Hawkins, and Sally Hawkins is this, I can't really do it because, I'm, of course, I've, I've grown this massive beard. But she has this kind of lower lip quivering Going kind of eyelid fluttering, kind of small, small, hunched over person, you know, not, not wanting to make too much trouble, which I find frankly rather irritating after a while. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake, woman, you know, step up, sh shout a bit. And the other thing about the film, of course, is, is that it is incredibly um, brutal uh, and possibly. Um, what's the word, over-the-top brutal against the University of Leicester, which comes out really, really poorly in this film. 
And is that true? Well, they say it's based on a true story. Well, no, they didn't say it's based on a true story. They say it is a true story. So I have to assume that it is true. And the University of Leicester didn't provide her with, well, they provided her with a small amount of assistance. And when she found the body, oh, plot spoiler, uh, they steal all the credit and she's put into the background and it's all very sad and, and so on and so forth. But, may, you know, maybe she gets back with Steve Coogan, who she's kicked out previously. Sorry, another plot spoiler there. And um, uh, and her life goes off in a in a new direction, and and there it is. So I suppose it's a it's quite a nice film. It's it's quite a it's quite a feel good film. I suppose there's a uh, there's a quest, and there's always, it's always a good thing at the end of the quest if they find whatever it is that they were questing for. And she finds she finds the skeleton under a car park, Leicester. In case you were wondering, um, and. Uh, it, it, that's it, really. Now, what I would suggest you do, uh, first of all, there is a, there is a book uh, a, a, about Richard III. It is a novel. It is a very famous novel. It is one of the, I don't know whether it's one of the first books, it's one of the first novels to uh, uh, present a kind of revisionist view of Richard. And it's called The Daughter of Time. And it was written by a lady called Josephine Tay, T-E-Y. I think in the early 50s. And it is a superb kind of detective story of somebody trying to find out the truth, possibly the truth, of which I highly recommend that. I would also highly recommend uh, The Rest is History podcast, which is presented by two people, Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook. And they have done two podcasts on The Princes in the Tower. And I would strongly recommend that you A, read The Daughter of Time, and B, listen to both of these podcasts before you go and see the film. Because I think you'll get a lot more out of the film if you have this background to it. If, of course, you're not already uh, fascinated by the whole story of Richard III, and you are a member of the Richard III Society. So, uh, is it any good? Yeah, it's all right. Should you go and see it? Yeah, why not? Why not? Passes the time quite pleasantly. And... Shall we dream? Not dream, no. Can we imagine a parallel universe in which Prince Andrew does become king? And I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks for watching and see you next time.